Mr. Wolfston has spoken and written on broader policy and service issues for higher education with articles published in the Chronicle for Higher Education, Inside Higher Education, and the Wall Street Journal. He holds a BA in Mathematics and Psychology from Western Michigan University and an MS in Computer and Communication Sciences from the University of Michigan. Please welcome Jim Wolfston. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your attendance here this morning and the opportunity to speak to you. And uh, the appreciation isn't because there was some kind of speakers committee that was trying to decide, is this uh, speaker going to be Oprah Winfrey or <laughs> maybe Harrison Ford? He's from Kansas. Oh, no, we'll pick Jim Wolston. No, that's not, the, uh, that, that's not the reason for my appreciation. The reason for my appreciation is the fact that as one of the lead researchers for the Social Mobility Index, I have a, a, a strong belief, a strong sense that what you're doing may very well be the most important work we can do in this society at this, at this time. And what I'm going to do is help give you some of the macroeconomic information that I hope will allow you to see that the satisfaction that you take as a counselor when you help a student advance through academics and eventually to college, that that satisfaction can be compounded by the fact that that work, that work of advancing people up the economic ladder is critical to keeping world peace. All right, so let me explain what I mean. Stephen Hawking wasn't just an astrophysicist who taught us about black holes. He was also an observer of what's happening in the world. And after the Brexit vote, the Brexit was a decision on the UK's part to basically exit from the European Union. They basically said, to heck with you elites. We're not going to be part of, of this globalization anymore. It's not working for us. And quite to the surprise of the elites in Britain, they in fact voted to exit uh, the European Union, hence the nickname Brexit. So Hawking said, well, what's going on here? Uh, how, is it, how is it the case? He's saying that we need to pay attention to the fact that the people in this uh, part of the European Union, most of the people outside of London, have no opportunity. They're stuck on antidepressants. Uh, they're not happy with the prospects, their economic mobility. All the wealth is happening in London. And so the voters said, to, to heck with it, we're done with it. We're, we don't want it, we gotta try something else. And Hawking's saying we have to pay attention to this. This isn't just a, a phenomenon of, 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 the, of the recent election. This is a phenomenon that reflects danger uh, historically. Now there's two things he had in mind. He had in mind the fact that fairness is an important innate concept for all of us. I'm a father. Don't mess with my kids. I'm the papa bear. I'm going to protect them. Right? So that's a virtue, that's a wonderful thing that we have is that sense of fairness and that sense of drive to protect uh, justice. But that also has the other side of the sword, which is that we'll fight for that. We'll, we'll go to war for that. And we've seen that again and again in history. So the other part of it is that if incomes and wealth diverge, if they split, and they seem to do so historically from the earliest times, the only resolution, the only leveler for that, historically, has been war and conflagration. Now this book is very interesting, it just came out in 2017, to essentially affirm Hawking's intuition. His intuition is A, you've got a strong sense of fairness and justice in the human psyche, but B, if, if we allow uh, divisions in wealth and income to continue to spiral out of control in this world, the only way it's going to get uh, settled is by another war. Well, we can't afford that in a, nu in a nuclear tipped world is the message that he is trying to deliver to us. We have to develop channels, better channels to elevate people, to give people opportunity to advance economically and socially through our societies. And again, this is confirmed through this scholarly work uh, done by a Stanford University professor called The Great Leveler. And I'm going to give you some examples of this. Now, why does this pertain to us? Well, it pertains to us because I think we actually have a chance to do something important that we never had a chance to do before in the agrarian age because the game in the agrarian age was who could get the land. That was the means of production. And then in the industrial age, the, the game was who has power over the factories. Well, we're in the learning age 
And now, the greatest asset that we can distribute through our society is the power to understand, the power to learn. This is a fast-changing world, and it's changing faster and faster and faster. So the people who can learn are the ones who have the power. And we're all about distributing that. If that's only concentrated to the wealthiest people, then again, they'll have all the advantage. And we'll have this unfairness that may, in fact, lead to global conflagration. We don't want that. And you're part of the antidote to that. You're part of helping advance people who, at least to this point, haven't had those kinds of economic opportunities. So let's look a little bit at, at history here. And what I'm doing here is using a kind of metaphor of the balance beam. What was going on? We had absolute inequality back in, in the peasant times in the 1500s in Europe. We had the, uh, the kings and we had the Catholic uh, Church. Absolute wealth inequality, everybody else was poor. But uh, as a kind of counterbalance to that, we had the pieties of the time. We had that, that uh, every man is equal in the eyes of God. And uh, we had uh, access to, to the cathedrals, for example. Anybody could go into the cathedral, right? It was wonderful. Hey, we all have access to the cathedral. But then what happened is that the, the, the church blew it. They introduced this yet another advantage to the already very wealthy people called indulgences. They said, look, if, if you consort with your mistress and you violate uh, fealty to your wife, no problem, just pay us a little of extra money as an indulgence and we'll let you off the hook. The peasants were appalled. They said, no, no, this is ridiculous, we can't do this. And hence was a German peasant revolt of the 1500s, which caused 100,000 deaths. Now eventually, uh, the peasants went back to their fields because the church, Catholic Church got it. They withdrew the system of indulgences. Uh, Martin Luther uh, produced a schism, hammered his proclamation on the church door, and said, we're gonna do a different path here. Uh, and so, uh, in that period of quiescence, uh, a resolution of sorts occurred until a couple hundred years later, and we hit the French Revolutionary Wars, which destroyed not 100,000 people, but five million people in total. And it started with taxes on the poor. Now think about this country. This country was founded no taxation without representation. It was a rebellion against the elites in Britain who were basically trying to extract value from this nation. We said no. Well, the same kind of thing happened in France to trigger the French Revolution, and eventually uh, the guillotining of uh, tens of thousands of people and the su subsequent wars that, that killed five billion people. So inequality was reset. Injustice was reset through conflagration. Move the clock forward another hundred years. Now we hit what was called the Bell Epic. Now, unfortunately in the United States and in the world, as, you're, as you see, we are approaching the levels of income and wealth inequality that were extant during the so-called Bell Epic in Europe. Uh, there were a few very, very wealthy people, uh, but then there were a bunch of very, very poor people. So the conditions were right, the conditions were set, as this University of Chicago article indicates, for the eruption of, of the First World War, which killed not five million people, but 20 million people, okay? It's getting worse, right? And, and then finally, of course, that was resolved, uh, but the United States and the other powers uh, uh, imposed reparations on Europe, which caused a terrible economic strife and tremendous resentment in Germany for the wealthy Jewish families who seemed to be able to escape the, the, the scourge of, of these reparations. And uh, hence rose Adolf Hitler. And this time, of course, it wasn't uh, 20 million, it was 50 million people killed. And this is Hawking's point, that we are living in a nuclear-tipped world. We have to figure out how to solve the question of growing e economic inequality, both in terms of wealth and income. Is there a way for us to do this? You folks are part of the solution. And if you can see that you're playing in this geopolitical space, where your role isn't just to help single individuals, but to create a kind of template, both as counselors and as a university, for how the universities of this country need to act. We have a chance, because we're in the learning age. Now, it wasn't just the case that uh, there was a problem in the UK. That wasn't the only thing that Hawking was aware of. He was aware of the fact that this is pervasive in the developed nations, particularly in the United States. We lead 
unfortunately, in a number of things. We lead in uh, uh, t uh, television watching per capita at 7.4 hours per man, woman, and child in the United States. But we also lead in what's called the Gini coefficient. And that's basically how income is spread and disparate throughout our population. And so it's a kind of measure of what percentage of the total income that's out there would have to be redistributed in order for everybody to be equal. It's not a suggestion of policy at all. It's just simply an indicator of the, the chasm that exists between the poorest earners and those who are at the top. And in the United States, just like the voters for Brexit, we voted for Donald Trump. Donald Trump is an unlikely populist, but nonetheless he hit a nerve, which is those counties in the United States of America where there isn't the sense of opportunity, there isn't the sense of, 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 of the chance to get ahead. There, there's there's a, a sense that the swamp needs to be drained. These are the people that, that voted for, for Donald Trump. And one of his ideas is that he's going to set it right. He's going to set it right for the working people of, of America because we've basically been screwed. We've been screwed by the people out there. Uh, it is true that we have a problem with respect to the trade deficit. The United States last year, in 2017, disgorged over $500 billion to other countries. The net trade balance was $500 billion in favor of other nations. And Trump's aware of that. He knows that's a problem. But there's another problem that's deeper than that, that we're not hearing a lot about. And that's the exploding divergence, economic divergence that's happening in the United States of America. The United States is now the least economically mobile among all developed nations. As of uh, 2014, there was a study done in Science Magazine to affirm this. Uh, the levels of wealth and in income inequality here in the United States are approaching the bell epic, the era right before World War I. It's in the United States, get this, Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, and Warren Buffett, three people have more wealth than the bottom 180 million people in this country. Okay? The retiring U.S. generation is now better educated than the replacement generation. Well, that's because it's too expensive to go to college. And that's a problem, of course, in a learning age, in a knowledge age. We need people, we need workers who can think, who can solve problems, who can create, who can innovate. Now, here's the, here's the underlying interesting problem. While we have this disgorgement of wealth from the United States of America, $500 billion to primarily China and, and Germany and other nations, look what's happening here inside our country just last year in 2017. Now, this is the profile of wealth distribution in the U.S. 75% of the wealth is owned by the top 10%. Okay, fine and dandy. But the gap between the top 10%, the owners of the 75% of the wealth of this nation, and the bottom 90% grew last year by $3.4 trillion. Okay? That's tantamount to a transfer of half of that, $1.7 trillion, which is three times the trade deficit. Okay? Three times the trade deficit was transferred from the bottom 90% of the population, largely those of us in this room, to the top 10%. Quietly happening every year. Now, there's a sense that there's some unease. We can see CNN today with the pipe bombs and the growing divisions in the United States and so on. There's a sense that there's something going on, something strange. So, unfortunately, there's a lot of folks that believe it's some kind of conspiracy. There were some folks back during the 50s, the so-called Illuminati, who planned this out, and that there are reptilian creatures from the other planets that are controlling all this. 50% of the United States of America now believes in some kind of conspiracy theory. But in fact, because of big data, we're starting to understand it's not a conspiracy, it's just arithmetic. I mean, it's, it's funky arithmetic, but it's arithmetic nonetheless. That augurs for divergence, that tends the, the system towards enriching the already rich and, relatively speaking, uh, uh, impoverishing the poor uh, classes, unless something is done. So here's a correlation that Thomas Piketty and his colleagues at the University of California, Berkeley, conjured about four or five years ago, R is greater than G. 
All right, what this means is the rate of return on capital. If you own a, a, a building and you're renting it out, the chances are after you pay taxes and so on, if you're average, you'll get 5% per annum. Well, if the average returns on capital, which worldwide, all across, uh, across all asset classes, whether we're talking about stocks, whether we're talking about bonds, whether we're talking about uh, real estate, if that's 5%, and the growth rate of income in a cohort, say in the United States, is less than that, automatically that's a diverging force. It means that the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer. And that's if, that's if that say 3% in that income was actually spread evenly across the population, which isn't even the case. Uh, it typically, the growth in income, particularly after the last recession, went primarily to the top wage earners of this country. So this force exists. It's not a conspiracy, it's just arithmetic. And this historically is what's happened, uh, this is from Piketty's book, where he's saying from uh, the earliest period, uh, there was always a, a diverging kind of uh, relationship between the return on capital and the growth of world output, but except for this period during the, the Great Conflagration, during 1913 through 2012. That was a period of convergence, largely because of the destruction of the wealth uh, that existed throughout Europe and, and, uh, and then of course the, the growth in the, in the middle class in the United States of America. These were actually in, in a historical times a kind of aberrance, a kind of unusual circumstance. There's another arithmetic fact and that is that GNP growth itself exacerbates divergence when income and wealth are spread unequally. Okay, now I'm gonna show you how this works. Now imagine, this has got nothing to do with class warfare. People say, oh, it's political. It's, it's just got to do with, with the haves, uh, or the have-nots <laughs> complaining about the haves. No, no, no. This is structural. It's really important that we all understand this. So here I am down here. I, I got my $10,000 house. I, I, I got this really nice house. I got a view of the river and the mountains. It's really nice. But up on the hill is this other dude with a $100,000 house. Okay, I'm not envious. I got a great view. What's the problem? Not, a, not an issue. What happens if economic growth occurs and now we both doubled? Okay? We both doubled. I still have a nice view. In fact, I have a nicer view. This is a, there's no problem here. He's got an even nicer view, right? The slope has changed. Now, I don't even have to be uh, envious. I still have a nice view. What I need to be aware of as a citizen, as a member of this world, is that this is a structural risk, okay? What can happen? Anybody have an idea what could happen on this hillside? Well, let me show you. That's what Hawking is aware of throughout history, that growing inequality can create a steeper slope that triggers the avalanche that wipes out all the houses. So the guy at the top has to be worried about that. They can't keep saying, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter, it's class envy and so on. Everybody needs to be concerned about this structural characteristic. Does this make sense to folks? Do you get it? Now it's interesting because you hear people apologizing. They say, a rising tide lifts all boats, right? Okay? That's not the proper metaphor. This is the proper metaphor. The proper metaphor is that uh, steeper slopes trigger the avalanches that wipe out all, all houses, okay? It's not the rising tide lifts all boats. Here's what happens when the rising tide lifts all boats. Think about it, okay? If I have $10,000 and you have $100,000 and there's no highway system, but all of a sudden a highway system is instituted. What's that worth to, to you? What's that worth to me? It's really valuable. It's great how I got here. It's probably worth at least a million dollars. But it's no more valuable to me than it is to you or to some rich person. Investment in infrastructure does lift all boats. Okay? Now, even scholars have gotten this wrong. They've, they've not only missed missed the metaphor, but they've actually misquoted John Kennedy. So here's some scholars from all these great schools, the University of Michigan, I went there, 
uh, California Davis and Princeton saying, oh, uh, GNP growth, uh, rising tide lifts all boats. It's great, no problem. But I showed you the problem. But here's what Kennedy actually said. And those people who say it's pork barrel, what's more wasteful? The waste of life and property and hope? Which is more wasteful? Or a multi-purpose project which can be used by all of our people? Which is more wasteful? To fail to tap the energies of that river, to let that water flood, to deny this chance for the development of recreation and power, or to use it, and to use it wisely. Which is more wasteful? To let the land wash away, to let it lie arid, or to use it, and use it wisely, and to make those investments which will make this a richest state and country in the years to come. These projects produce wealth. They bring industry. They bring jobs. And the wealth they bring brings wealth to other sections of the United States. This state had about 200,000 cars. 1929, it has a million cars now. They weren't built in this state. They were built in Detroit. As this state's income rises, so does the income of Michigan. And as the income of Michigan rises, so does the income of the United States. A rising tide lifts all the boats. And as Arkansas becomes more prosperous, so does the United States. Okay, now that was, that was Kennedy's real quote. That was a quote, that was a true statement accurate about investments in infrastructure. In that case, it was to, uh, to uh, initiate this dam in Arkansas. Uh, everybody benefited from that. It was a recreational area for everyone, power for everyone. That's what he was talking about. He wasn't talking about just GNP growth or whenever your boat goes up, <laughs> don't worry about it, everybody's cool. He's not saying that. He was talking about infrastructure. So think about that slope and think about the role of education in this scale, and we've got the same kind of slope. And what's happened, unfortunately, in the past 50 years is we've seen education become a weight for income and wealth inequality. We can change that. You're part of changing that. Wichita State University is part of the leadership we need in this country to change this dynamic. Because what you're doing is the right thing. You're taking people who are previously underserved and elevating them educating them through the system. You're not just calling for the already wealthy and anointing them to be the next quote unquote leaders. No, you're doing something important. Important because now we have a tuition bomb. There's a ankle brace, $1.1 trillion around the next generation. The emissions game, that's how CollegeNet has become so interested and exercised about this because we have patents and we filed uh, uh, patents and have uh, uh, m many years ago and became the earliest provider of web-based admissions applications. So we started to see what was going on in college admissions in the United States of America. We realized that standardized testing is biased to the rich. And the U.S. News and World Report is really a chase for glory. It came out of the 80s, the Gilded Era, where it was all about celebrating the entrepreneurs and celebrating the rich and so on. And that's fundamentally what U.S. News and World Report does every year. It celebrates the rich. One of the most important uh, criteria for your U.S. News and World Report glory is how big your endowment is. Well, who cares? It depends on what you use it for. Scholastic aptitude test. We now know that the number one correlator to that is family income. And we also have universities saying, okay, look, we're virtuous because the number of Pell Grant recipients we have went up 10%. Even though the, the percentage of Pell Grant recipients at the institution is still minuscule. But moreover, we have this other problem that's being understood now, is that Pell Grants increasingly are going to already wealthy people. We can see this from iPads. The data from which we developed the social mobility index is from iPads. And we can see in there that, gee, every year, uh, the percentage of students who are already well off are getting the Pell Grants. How does this make any sense? And the problem with this is that racial wealth inequality, it, 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 when, when we favor the rich in higher education, when we favor the rich, that's tacitly, implicitly racist. That's not right. Here's the thing I'm really concerned about as a technologist and an employer. I'm concerned about economic homogeneity diluting the development of educational rigor. I'm serious about this because I see people coming out of school and they come to interview at our company. I like the people who have had a lot of experience and seen a lot of things and don't 
believe that they have the quote unquote right answers. It's really important to have a pliable brain, to have the ability uh, to, to look at Jim Wilson and say, okay, you think you're smart, but wait a minute, you may be wrong. Uh, that's critical thinking. And the chances for that grow if the people that we're encountering on campus are from different experiences than we've had. We have a much greater chance than if everybody's cookie cutter from the same country club. We know about basic critical thinking. Uh, we see a lot of that in, in Washington, D.C., where people say, oh, you're wrong, you're wrong, and they have a good argument as to why the other person's wrong. But we don't see a whole bunch of advanced critical thinking, the ability to turn that question mark at your own ideas. And the chances for that are greater if there's more diversity economically on campus, more diversity in background. Think about it. The people who figured out that the earth is not flat, they were born that way. And they were taught it was flat. You go outside, it's flat here, that's for sure. I've seen it. <laughs> and uh, if I'm born that way and I come out in Kansas and I see this, duh, why should I think otherwise? Well, they had to disagree with their own idea that was set in, their early, in the early part of their lives. Same plan with respect to the, to the uh, heliocentric uh, solar system, okay? Uh, it used to be believed that the Earth was a center. Uh, it, somebody had to actually disagree with their own inherited idea. That's advanced critical thinking, the power to say I could be wrong. Uh, I, somebody else has taught me there's another way. That, the chances for the gestation of that go up when there's economic heterogeneity. So, in closing, thank you for your attention. We need to change the attribution of prestige so it's delivered to this institution, to Wichita State University, to the University of California, Santa Cruz, to the University of California, Irvine, to Baruch University, to the universities that are quietly elevating people and advancing social and economic mobility. Interestingly, the, the roots of the word prestige, it means trick or illusion, right? Prestidigitation, if you're doing a card trick, right? So think about that when somebody talks about how prestigious they are. Now, this book, The Great Leveler, is saying we don't have anything in history to say that, that we can solve this problem of economic divergence. There's nothing in history other than war and conflagration. Well, we have a chance because this age is different. That real asset, again, is not the land, it's not the industrial capacity, it's the power to think. It's the power to learn. If we can distribute that, like you're doing at this institution, across our society more broadly, we may have a chance at a soft landing for dangerous divergence in wealth and income in the United States. Thank you. <laughs>